Welcome everyone to Snorkel Science Talks, a series where we interview thought leaders in AI and discuss themes around making machine learning practical. I'm Paroma, one of the co-founders at Snorkel AI, and today I have the privilege of interviewing Professor Fred Sala from University of Wisconsin, and he's been part of the Snorkel team and a friend and a mentor. So thanks so much for chatting with us today, Fred. Thanks, Paroma. I'm excited to be here and excited for our chat. Fred and I actually met at the Stanford AI lab where we were working on Snorkel and the next thing we knew we were kind of going on the whiteboard writing equations down. So I guess I know the story after that but if you don't mind sharing with us what was your journey to doing machine learning and to Chris Ray's lab at Stanford till then? Yeah actually it was kind of a, a roundabout journey um, where I did a bunch of different things and then I kind of narrowed in on machine learning. So originally I started learning information theory, and this was you know, a decade ago when I was an undergrad. And it's this really beautiful science of how to communicate information, how to transfer it efficiently, how to deal with noise. It's actually pretty beautiful. And it's kind of like the most natural field if you're excited for the information age. Um, I guess the first sort of real aspect of information theory was Morse code, which was <laughs> one and a half centuries ago first time people try to encode information in a specific way just to be efficient. Of course, it wasn't called information theory because the field didn't exist yet. It took up until like the 1940s and 50s for the field to be created in the first place. And there was just one guy who almost completely figured it out, um, Shannon. And then mm -hmm. everything else we've been doing since then has just been kind of filling in the footnotes and the details, which is actually quite crazy. So I've been working quite a lot on how to make memories more efficient in terms of correcting noise which is actually pretty fun because you think of information theory as trying to deal with communications and you think of that as, you know, here's a person who wants to talk to a different person some distance away. How do we make that efficient? How do we deal with channel noise? Um, but then it turns out for memories, it's the same problem. It's just you're communicating through time instead of space. So you record information on your hard drive and you want to come back to it, you know, a month or a year or a decade later and make sure it's still there and nothing's really changed in there. So I was working on these problems of protecting memories from errors, but then I realized that noise is actually everywhere in the data to start with for almost all of our data science applications. And then it doesn't really make sense for us to try to protect all of this data from noise when the noise is actually already in there to start with. So I started thinking more and more about what do we do with data? Why do we really care if it's noisy? When we do machine learning, for example, we already do noisy things like SGD just to learn our models. Mm -hmm. And then we even expect that our models are going to have some amount of noise. We want to be robust to that. Right. So I was thinking more and more about how do we make you know, information theory and machine learning kind of cooperate so we don't have to protect ourselves from noise that we don't really care about and we don't give up so much of our bandwidth and capacity and things like that. So that got me aimed in this direction of trying to do more machine learning things based on my information theory kind of background. And then uh, in terms of working with Chris, I, I saw that his lab had a bunch of people with lots of different backgrounds, things that I had never really thought about in terms of data science. So we have some mechanical engineers, we have mathematicians. I think we have someone with a music performance degree at oh, least. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was super excited about working with people who have a ton of different background points of view and different like approaches to problems. And then the best part was I ended up chatting with Chris, who immediately understood a very esoteric problem I was working on about generating functions in math. He was super excited about it. I realized immediately, you know, this is the person I want to work with. This is the right lab for me. So it was a, it was a pretty natural choice to go in this direction. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. And I think the one thing that really, um, you know, I can relate to as well as coming from an electrical engineering background and then moving into machine learning and especially weak supervision. Um, and, you know, kind of related to that, something that you've worked on a lot in the Snorkel ecosystem of projects is working on, you know, kind of the theoretical aspects. And then that's really allowed us to expand the types of domains and task types that we can um, apply Snorkel to. So how do, you, how do you kind of think about this connection between theory and application? Does one inspire the other? You know, is it kind of working together? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's definitely a mutual thing. 
I think that's the most exciting part about a field like machine learning. The theory isn't quite as esoteric as some of the mathematical theory out there, which tends to get pretty obscure. Um, but at the same time, even though it's a pretty empirical field, people are looking for understanding the, the fundamentals and seeing the limits and seeing kind of the theoretical underpinnings of this whole system. So both of them tend to go back and forth informing each other, which is the best thing you can have in these situations. And I think weak supervision is maybe one of the best examples of this kind of you know, theory helping out practice, creating new questions for theory to answer, and then continuing the cycle all the time. And I think you and I have worked quite a bit on that. So things like understanding how to make video for weak supervision, right. um, that was a major challenge just because none of our stuff scaled up yeah. to what we needed for weak supervision to actually work. And then we realized we could do all kinds of crazy theory stuff to make it happen. And then amazingly, it actually worked And it worked happened out, so. and it worked. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I, I actually think this is going to be the right approach for weak supervision in the future too. Um, keep pushing both the practice and the theory and keep communicating and have them helping each other out. Yeah, that's amazing. And very related to that, what are some of the kind of most exciting directions in the weak supervision space? It doesn't have to be snorkel, you don't have to be biased, but you're looking at, you know, what you've seen with your experience here, what would be the most exciting thing for you? Yeah, I'm excited for a bunch of questions. We've been working so much all this time on classification problems, and we've gotten much, much better at them in lots of different domains. One area I'm curious to see if we can expand is if we can make snorkel work for regression and just more generally weak supervision for regression models, which feels like a natural place for us to go look at. And it's going to cover a lot of different kinds of problems out there that so far we haven't tackled. Right. I'm also super excited for a lot more of this kind of multi-domain, multi-task, multi-everything approach to weak supervision. Right. Um, just because, you know, we can scale up to these kinds of tasks and then we can handle pretty much any kind of system mm -hmm. that we want to throw it to. So I think we're going to keep working in that direction. I think most likely we're going to have to learn more about how to make it work for very, very large scales, yeah. which is something that we've been working on for quite a while anyway. Right. Um, especially at the massively multi-task kind of problems that we're super excited by now. Yeah. And I, I definitely agree. I think I the video example that you were giving, you know, that was kind of the first layer of uh, types of projects where we saw where scale was an issue. And there's definitely a lot more to explore there and use, especially in the area of uh, weak supervision. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, I know that apart from weak supervision, you've also done a lot of work in um, causal inference, in information encoding, like you just said, you know, graph embedding. So what was the relationship between all of these projects? How did you get interested in, you know, the combination of these? Great question. Yeah, so I, I think what's in common for all these different threads is uh, they're all basically limitations of data in some sense. Right, so when, when we've been working on weak supervision, the limitation is that we don't have labels or it's, it's too expensive to gather these kind of manually written labels for all our data. But for things like, like causal inference, the challenge there is that we don't know the causal direction mm -hmm. of variables in the data. Um, that's a limitation that we don't get to see. We only get to see co-occurrence or correlations or sort of the way data works together, but not the actual direction there. So we have to sort of deal with that lack of knowledge about the direction with some other means. And that's what causal inference ends up being all about. And then similarly, for trying to understand how to embed information, the limitation there is the fact that the data doesn't have a format we can directly use for all our models. Um, maybe it's not encoded in vectors or matrices. It's in something like relationships between objects. And then we have to figure out the right way to encode that into things that are friendly to machine learning. So in all these cases, it's all about we have this real life data, it's got its limitations. Mm -hmm. We need to overcome those limitations in some way to make it useful. Right. And, and I think there's actually many different areas that can be viewed this way. Um, so it's kind of one of these uniting threads for machine learning in general. And it's one of the things I'm excited about. Yeah, no, I, I really love that. I love that idea of, you know, saying there's data and it's not in the cleanest way and there's just different yeah. ways of, of dealing with that. Um, and talking of common threads in research, one thing that I wanted to ask you about was just your path and how you got to the decision of doing academia. Um, you know, I, we met when you were a postdoc, you know, you were an EE first. So how did you go from there to uh, becoming a professor at Wisconsin? And, you know, what were the trade-offs or decisions going through your head during that process? Yeah, it's one of the most interesting questions that you deal with, especially if you end up going to academia. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this 
why did you go in this path? <laughs> what are the other possibilities? And, and it's actually a pretty interesting question too. I think for me, there's these classical answers like you have more freedom to study some particular problems mm -hmm. um, in academia than you would in industry. Right. Although I do think there's kind of a gradient where you can find you know, the right trade off for yourself between how much freedom to work on the problems you want to have and sort of how much influence you'll have in the way things work in the world, which mm -hmm. in industry can often be pretty big. Right. Um, but I think the really exciting thing for me for academia is the fact that you get to work with young people. Um, and that's something that's really energizing for me. So it's fun to see people who come in. They're, they're very ambitious and very mm -hmm. enthusiastic, um, but they haven't quite you know, gotten the point where they can do research on their own. Right. They don't necessarily know all these fields. Yeah. Um, and then seeing them like develop and grow and helping influence that and helping shape their, their trajectory, um, that's something awesome that I really enjoy. And that's kind of the real reason I made the decision to go into academia. Right. Uh, and just starting out now, I'm getting to see some of that with students who are coming to talk to me. Um, and I can sort of see the first steps on this journey that they're going to have intellectually. And then, you know, we'll see where that goes. Oh, and, and there's another similarity here, too. I, I do feel like in some ways academia is kind of like the startup world. Mm -hmm. uh, just because you're kind of setting up from the beginning, starting up right. a lab from scratch, yeah. right? Yeah, it's an experience that you have and, you know, you fully understand the challenges that come with that. Um, and then you have to do things like differentiate yourself from mm -hmm. the whole world of research out yeah. there. Um, you have to figure out the right people to work with, just you know, talking about students. And then you also have to depend on advice from people who've sort of been there and have this experience, um, just because their advice is so invaluable. Exactly the same as we have you know, at Snorkel and, and other startups do. Yeah, no, and just a shout out to everyone watching. Fred is an amazing mentor and it's really great working with him. <laughs> so I would advise everyone to, you know, if you get the chance, you should, you should definitely work with Fred. Um, to wrap up, how can the audience find you? You know, Twitter, website, anything else you want to share? Yeah, I'm on Twitter where I tweet about my work typically and I also waste time more generally, <laughs> um, but also my website as well. Great, we'll put links to that in the video here. And thank you again for spending time with us today, Fred. Really enjoyed this conversation and thanks to our viewers for joining us at Science Talks. Thanks so much, I really appreciate it. It was fun to chat.